A few weeks into the First World War, an armada of more than 30 British warships launched an audacious raid on the main base of the German High Seas Fleet. Approaching to within a few miles of the German coast, they would fight a fierce and chaotic battle in the first clash of the two most powerful navies in the world. This video is sponsored by Endel, an audio app that creates personalised soundscapes to help you focus, relax or sleep more effectively. More on this later. After Britain entered the First World War on August 4th, 1914, there was initially little action at sea. With the situation in France worsening in the face of the German invasion, this was a disappointment to the British public. A hundred years of naval domination had led the British to expect nothing less than a second, more glorious Trafalgar as soon as the war began. Instead, three weeks had gone by without any serious engagement between the newly formed Grand Fleet and their German opponents. Winston Churchill, the first Lord of the Admiralty, shared this impatience for action and had been badgering officers for more offensive actions to be taken. So, when Commodore Roger Keyes, commanding Britain's 8th submarine flotilla, presented just such an idea, Churchill was all ears. Keyes' submarines had spent the previous few weeks patrolling close to the main German naval base at Wilhelmshaven, in an area known as the Heligoland Bight, and had found a vulnerability in the defences. Because of the confined geography of the Bight, the Germans had not established any defensive minefields to prevent enemy penetrations into the area. Instead, they relied on a complex system of patrols by destroyers. The plan was for the two destroyer flotillas of Commodore Reginald Tirrit's Harwich Force, some 30 ships, to sweep through the Bight from east to west, ambushing a German patrol and quickly overwhelming it before retreating. Keyes' own submarines would lie in wait in the area, waiting to torpedo any German ships that came out to join the battle. Approved on August 24th for execution four days later, this was a bold and risky plan, committing 40 British warships to within a few miles of the German coast. When Admiral John Jellicoe, the commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet, heard of the plan, he was immediately concerned about the strength of the forces involved. He offered to reinforce the covering forces for the operation with the participation of his battle fleet, but was told curtly, Cooperation by battle fleet not required. Battle cruisers can support if convenient. Deciding that it very much was convenient, Jellicoe dispatched Vice Admiral David Beatty with the battle cruisers Lion, Queen Mary, and Princess Royal, along with Commodore William Goodenough's first light cruiser squadron. These ships would join up with the battle cruisers Invincible and Australia to provide insurance for Tierwitz destroyers. By the morning of August 27th, all of the British forces were at sea. BT was steaming south at speed, as yet unsure what exactly was going on as very little information had been provided to the Grand Fleet about the operation. The destroyer flotillas, led by Tirwit and Captain Wilfred Blunt, were moving steadily east along with Keyes, who would be overseeing his submarines from the destroyer Lurcher. Both the British Commodores had already left Harwich by the time a signal arrived informing Tirwit that BT and Goodenough would be assisting the operation. Incredibly, this information was not passed on to the Commodore at sea. This meant that the destroyers and the British submarines would have no idea that friendly heavy ships could be in the area, having already been told to expect any large ships to be German. By noon on August 27th, BT finally had the details of the planned sweep across the Heligoland Bight, but still had no idea where the British submarines were. Nevertheless, he positioned his ships to support the destroyers. Commodore Goodenough's light cruisers were ordered to steam 10 miles astern of the destroyers, while the five battle cruisers sat off 30 miles to the northwest. Shortly before dawn on August 28th, Goodenough was spotted by Tirwit, who thought the light cruisers were hostile and was surprised to discover they were in fact British. Goodenough informed Tirwit of his and BT's dispositions. This was good news, but Commodore Keyes and the submarines were still none the wiser. It was a foggy morning. Visibility throughout the coming battle would be no more than 5,000 yards. At 6.53, Tierwitz's 3rd destroyer flotilla contacted the German patrol line north of Heligoland, 
forcing it to fall back and detaching four destroyers in pursuit. The alarm on the German side was quickly raised and reached Vice Admiral Franz Hipper, who had overall responsibility for the defence of the Bight. As far as Hipper could make out, this looked like a raid by British destroyers, so he deployed his available cruisers to counter it. Rear Admiral Ebrecht Mass's second scouting group was ordered north with five light cruisers to reinforce the Stettin and Fraunlob, which were already at sea covering the patrolling destroyers. The light cruiser mines was also ordered into the area from the west, bringing the total number of cruisers deployed to eight. These reinforcements would take time to arrive, but in the meantime the second line of German destroyers moved north to assist their comrades, steaming into fog towards the sound of gunfire. The fifth torpedo boat flotilla was taken by surprise when British destroyers emerged from the mist and opened fire. From 7.30 a confused melee began, as the German patrols tried to pull back south of Heligoland and the British pursued them. The German destroyer G9 signalled for the 8-inch batteries on Heligoland itself to open fire, but the mist was so thick the gunners could not tell the two sides apart. Around the same time, Tierwitt became concerned that his detached destroyers could be overwhelmed by a larger German force and so diverted off course to the east to find and reunite with them. They soon engaged the German torpedo boats as they were squeezed southwards. At 7.58, the light cruiser Stettin emerged from the fog, driving north to cover the retreating torpedo boats. It was soon exchanging fire with HMS Fearless, the light cruiser leading the first destroyer flotilla. With strong fire from Stettin and the threat of coastal battery fire from Heligoland, Captain Blunt turned his flotilla away, heading westwards back towards the original course of the operation and sinking the destroyer V187 as they went. A gap now opened up between the two British destroyer flotillas, as Commodore Tierwitt took his ships further south and engaged the light cruiser Fraunlob. In a duel with Tierwitt's flagship Arethusa, both ships were heavily damaged, leading Fraunlob to return to port and Tierwitt to swing his force back to the west. While all of this was going on, an absolute farce was taking place to the west. At 8.10, Commodore Goodenough had detached Lowestoft and Nottingham to steam to Arethusa's aid and had continued south with his remaining ships. Also in the area was Commodore Keyes, overseeing the submarines with his two destroyers and with absolutely no idea the Goodenough ships were in the area. At 8.15, Keyes spotted Goodenough's two detached light cruisers and immediately reported them as hostile cruisers that he was in touch with. Goodenough himself intercepted this signal and, taking it at face value, resolved to take his four cruisers to Keyes' aid. This compounded the problem as at 8.53 Commodore Key spotted the dim shapes of four more light cruisers he didn't expect to be there. Believing he was now being pursued by six enemy cruisers, Keyes turned at high speed to the north to attempt to reach the safety of the battle cruisers and signalled to alert them of the danger following him. To the east, Commodore Tierwitt intercepted this message and, knowing that Goodenough was in the area, asked him to take his squadron and engage the ships chasing Keyes. Good enough obliged and steered north, not realising that he was being ordered to go into action against himself. The confusion was eventually ended when Good enough got close enough to Keyes that his ships could be identified as British. Cruisers are our cruisers whose presence in this area I was not informed, he signalled. Though all the relevant commanding officers had now been made aware of what ships they were fighting alongside, a feat that had taken until a mere three hours after the battle had begun, the danger was not over. Though Keyes knew good enough ships were friendly, his submerged submarine crews did not, and there was no way of telling them. This almost had fatal consequences when at 9.30 the submarine E6 fired torpedoes at HMS Southampton. Mercifully, they both missed, and the cruiser's subsequent attempt to ram the apparently hostile submarine was unsuccessful. For the next hour or so, there was a lull in the battle, as the British destroyer flotillas slowed to a crawl while both Fearless and Arethusa were being repaired. By 11 o'clock though, the German counter-attack was approaching. First up were the light cruisers Strasbourg and Cologne from Rear Admiral Maas's 2nd Scouting Group. Both ships were turned away by massed torpedo attacks, but there were more coming, and with Arethusa damaged, Tierwitt knew that his flotillas were in trouble he signalled a report to Vice Admiral Beatty. Beatty did not waste much time in responding. 
With enemy forces massing, he judged that it was time to commit the battle cruisers in an attempt to wrap the battle up quickly before the German heavy ships had a chance to intervene. At 11.35, the Vice Admiral swung his five battle cruisers round to the southeast and proceeded at top speed. Meanwhile, Commodore Tierwitz destroyers were now under attack from the light cruiser mines. From 11.30, both Arethusa and Fearless returned fire as the German ship steamed north. At 11.50, mines were suddenly forced to come about when Goodenough's cruisers, who had spent the last hour repositioning, suddenly appeared in front, boxing mines into a corner. It now took a torrent of fire, and Tierwitz ordered 20 destroyers to begin torpedo runs on the light cruiser. The German ship kept up a fierce defence, even though she was totally outgunned. The destroyer Laurel was hit and crippled, before a torpedo hit from the destroyer Lydiard smashed Mines' engines. Drifting powerless and with a jammed rudder, the ship continued to fire at least two of its guns until she was finally scuttled at 12.25. The British started picking up survivors, a process that was greatly aided when Commodore Keyes arrived in HMS Lurcher and lashed it to the sinking vessel. 220 sailors were successfully taken off before mines slipped below the waves. The sinking of mines was a victory for Tierwitz, but he did not feel particularly comfortable. There were still at least three German light cruisers in the area and more on the way, and he'd have known that the longer the battle went on, the more likely it was that German heavy ships could arrive on the scene. So you can imagine just what a relief it would have been to see, at 12.37, the sight of five battle cruisers steaming out of the western mist at 28 knots, guns blazing. For the German crews, the situation was immediately desperate. Both the Strasbourg and Cologne were under Beatty's guns initially, but when the Strasbourg was able to retreat north, it left the Cologne agonisingly isolated. The heavy guns of the battle cruisers thundered, and in a few minutes, Cologne was turned into a blazing wreck. Not long afterwards, another cruiser appeared. It was the Ariadne, another of Rear Admiral Mars's light cruisers. It suffered much the same fate, crippled with a few salvos by the 13 and a half inch guns of Lion and Queen Mary. With the immediate danger to the flotillas cleared, Beatty now issued the one word signal, retire, to all British ships in the area. He then swung his ships around to the north, finished off Cologne, and steamed away to the northwest. The Battle of the Heligoland Bight was over. In material terms, the Battle of the Heligoland Bight was a relatively small affair, involving only a handful of capital ships. The battle, though, was an undoubted British victory. The Germans had lost three light cruisers and the destroyer sunk, with three more light cruisers damaged. German casualties numbered more than 1,200, with 712 killed, including Rear Admiral Maas, who had perished on board Cologne. British losses were more minor, one light cruiser and three destroyers damaged, with 75 casualties across all ships. Despite this, however, many on the British side were keenly aware of just how close to disaster the operation had come. The British had been extremely lucky that the German response hadn't been better coordinated, had Rear Admiral Mass launched an attack with two or three cruisers at once, rather than allowing his ships to attack piecemeal, he could well have mauled the destroyer for Tillers entirely. The poor communication over which ships would be even involved in the battle could have led on numerous occasions to terrible friendly fire incidents. It was a close run thing, but a victory nonetheless that gave a morale boost to Britain and was an embarrassment for the Kaiser's navy. There would, though, be plenty of chances in future battles for the High Seas Fleet to avenge it. Thank you to Endel for sponsoring this video. If you ever have a hard time focusing on work or switching off properly from it, then Endel could be a big help. It uses patented AI technology to create personalised soundscapes tailored to each user that can help you relax, focus or get off to sleep easier. Inside the app, you can select a variety of soundscapes tailored to different activities. Endel is backed by neuroscience and reacts to the time of day, the weather and even your heart rate if you have a smartwatch to pair with the app. Endel's sleep soundscapes have been created in collaboration with leading sleep scientists, naturally helping a good night's rest. The first 100 people to download Endel at the link in the description below will get a free week of audio experiences. Thanks again to Endel for sponsoring this video.